from the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. My name is Tony Sundermeyer, the senior pastor, and I want to thank you for watching today's broadcast. Now, I invite you to join in the worship of God.
Friends, good morning and welcome to this time of worship. It's so good to share this time together, though we're far apart, and to know that the reach of this church family is far beyond the sanctuary here at Peachtree and 16th Streets. I'm glad to be with you this morning. A special word of thanks to Lauren Smith for that beautiful prelude. Lauren is a recipient of the George Worth Scholarship for Music. She studies here at the School of Fine Arts in the studio of Brendan Callahan Fitzgerald. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing your gifts as part of our worship this morning. Friends, if you would take a moment and check in with us to let us know you're worshiping this morning, we use a text check-in. If you're a first-time visitor, please check first 1ST to 313131. Or if you have checked in with us before, text CHECK-IN, C-H-E-C-K-I-N, mushed into one word, to the same number, 313131. A couple of announcements about things that are happening in our lives together. This afternoon at 3 p.m., join us by live stream on whichever platform you prefer, Facebook, YouTube, or our website as our own Jens Korndurfer will be playing the organ with Atlanta Symphony Orchestra trumpeters Stuart Stevenson and Mike Tishione. They will be playing a number of pieces spanning three centuries, including Vivaldi's Concerto in C for two trumpets and Dupre's Remarkable Variations for Organ. It promises to be a gift of music. Last week, we launched a new uh, Thursday evening worship and theological formation schedule, calling it the Midweek Recharge. Join us again this Thursday, starting at 6.45 p.m., also on live stream, for a hymn, a prayer, and a sermon from the wisdom literature. This week's preacher will be Dr. Paul Roberts, a longtime friend of this congregation. Paul's a Presbyterian minister and he's the president of Johnson C. Smith Theological Seminary and a gifted preacher who will bring us a good word. After worship, there are class offerings from our Stembler scholar, Dr. Chris Holmes, and from our pastor, Reverend Jamie Butcher, beginning at 7.30, and our mission pastor, Lee Bonner, will facilitate a conversation online with some of our PCUSA mission coworkers so that we can learn more about the context where we have mission partnerships around the world. You can check our bulletin or website or your church email from Friday for more information and links about how to join those different online opportunities. Finally, friends, happy Mother's Day. Today we celebrate our mothers and all who have mothered us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We also lift up in love all who are apart today all who grieve the loss of a child or a mother, all who struggle with a challenging relationship or have none at all. Scripture tells us that God loves us as a mother, so this morning we rest all of us in the mothering love of our God, who made us, knows us, and loves us. Now we turn to worship. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. responsive call to worship, which is based on one of the lectionary readings for this morning from 1 Peter chapter 2. God, you call us together to be built into a spiritual house. We hear your call. You call us to be your people. We are bound together as a family of faith. You call us out of darkness. We walk together into your marvelous light. You call us to believe in you. Wherever we are, let us worship our God together.
invite you to join me in our unison prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, we come to you for refuge. We bring you our shortcomings and our failures, our sins and our mistakes. Do not let us be put to shame, but deliver us, for you are the strong fortress of our hearts, our rock, our leader, our guide, and our savior. Into your hands we commit our spirits and these times. We know that you are a listening God, so incline your ear to us. In our silence, Lord, hear our needs, our fears, and our worries. Lord, let your face shine upon us, today and always. Let us abide in your steadfast and redeeming love. Amen. In great mercy, God has given us a new birth into a living hope, for it is the risen Christ who stands in our midst and says, Peace be with you. We go forth to walk the path of new life and living hope, and may the peace of the risen Christ be with us and also with you. At this time, please text someone, a friend or a family member, someone from the church, peace be with you. Thanks as they move to Jens, Jacob, Wade, Brendan, Dan, Anna, Heather, Deanna, and baby Benjamin for the gift of music. It is both a balm and a joy to us. Thank you for sharing your gifts in our worship. Friends, we turn now to our scripture lesson for the day. It comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 33 to 43. Hear now God's word for you and for me. That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. 
They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. This is the word of the Lord. Our thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, let us see new things from these old words today as we meet you again. And may we go from this place energized and courageous to bring your light into darkness. Amen. I texted a friend this week to set up a time so that we could talk and catch up, and I asked her how her work is going these days. She wrote back that she's seeing new sides of her colleagues in COVID time. I don't know whether that's good or bad or both. I'll find out when we talk in a few days. But her comment resonated so much with me. I wrote back that I think we're all seeing a lot about a lot of things now. It's probably true about any time of crisis or challenge. We learn new things about ourselves and others. And we see some things that were always there, both good and bad, with a new clarity. Now, while we would never have hoped for coronavirus and we're eager for it to be behind us, this disruption of our regular waves gives us the chance to see ourselves and our world with some new clarity. My family saw a video this week that is being shared around the internet called The Great Realization. Maybe some of you have seen it. It captures this experience of seeing things with new eyes. It was written by a poet named Thomas Roberts who lives in England. It shows a sleepy dad, and off camera, you hear the voice of the young son he is trying to put to bed. The little boy, like all kids at bedtime, doesn't want to go to sleep. He wants to hear one more story, and he begs for the one about the virus. Now that sounds weird to us who are living through this. The virus is not the stuff of fairy tales or bedtime stories. But the video is set sometime in the future, looking back at the year 2020. So this little boy, like all little kids, wants to hear about something his dad lived through that he knows only as history. So his dad reads a long poem that describes what the world looked like before we knew about the coronavirus. It describes what we learned during this time and how we saw things differently afterward. Part of the poem goes like this. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's 2020. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick you could have anything you dreamed of in a day and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted and the work-life balance broke. And the children's eyes grew squarer and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but amidst the noise, they felt alone. And every day, the skies grew thicker till you couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them while down below we filled our cars. We filled the sea with plastic because our waste was never capped. Until each day when you went fishing, you'd pull them out already wrapped. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. 
But while we all were hidden, amidst the fear and all the while, the people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you and calling up their mums. It does say mums, it is a British poem. And while the car keys gathered dust, they looked forward to their runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe and the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled to the seas. Some people started dancing, some were singing, some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but some good news was in the making. And so when we found the cure and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. Old habits became extinct and they made way for the new, and every simple act of kindness was now given its due. The poem goes on, and I've cut some parts out of it. And then at the end, the little boy asks why it took a virus for the world to change. A good question, don't you think? I don't share this poem to be trite or glib or to suggest that making the world better will be as easy as baking or taking a run. But the poem paints a hopeful picture of people realizing that they don't want everything to go back to the way it was. They want the world to come out of this time healthier and more just and more kind. I share it because it captures our moment right now. We want to hold on to the good we see and we want to change the things we see about our world that are not right. I share it because today we join Jesus' disciples to see our Lord with new eyes and get a second wind to work for his mission of justice and love. So let's start with the good. When we look around us in these disorienting days, there is so much good to see, positive outcomes we want to hold on to whenever our lives get into a new rhythm. For example, yesterday on a Zoom call, a church member shared that usually her family doesn't get to worship together, but now that we're online, wherever they are, they all log on or call in with their flip phones and worship together at 11 o'clock on a Sunday. We celebrate the good of dusting off our instincts to get outside and run and play. The good of this break for families in one sense who were stretched and overscheduled and didn't know how to pause any of their activities. We celebrate the good of music and art being shared freely for us all to enjoy, of people reaching out with technology and making good old telephone calls and hollering across the street or across their yard to their neighbors. We celebrate this breather for God's weary earth. We see good, new expressions of gratitude for people whose jobs were always essential to our lives, but who are all too often invisible. And we see compassion coming to life as people pay attention to their neighbors, the lonely, the sick, and the vulnerable. We celebrate all this good, and today may we commit to making these permanent changes in how we live. But friends, everything we're seeing with new eyes isn't so good. The poem I just read also highlights how broken our world was before we even knew about the coronavirus. And in fact, even the poem's hopeful picture of lessons learned shows a privileged version of social distancing, the one where people have time to run and dance and bake without fear of losing their income or their housing, without being threatened with domestic violence, without being paralyzed by anxiety or falling ill. With these new eyes, we see how much our world needs to change and how desperately we need the light of Jesus Christ to shine into our darkness and give us new sight. The coronavirus came into a context of profound economic disparity, and that hasn't changed. COVID time has just put a spotlight on the structures of our world that are straining to the point of breaking from healthcare to employment to safe and affordable housing. If anything, we see even more clearly now that while we're all in the same storm, some are in sturdy boats, 
inconvenienced, but confident that they'll weather it while others sink, while they bail with all their might. The coronavirus came into a context of consumerism, and that hasn't changed much. We might have slowed down a bit, but we're still, many of us, over consumers of everything, from food to products to technology to information. We see that while some people are annoyed because the supply chain is tangled and it's hard to find toilet paper, others are truly hungry because schools are closed, work is dried up, and places that usually help are closed. The coronavirus has highlighted our complicated relationship with technology. We see clearly now the gap that divides those who can pivot into online work and worship and learning and those who don't have access, who fall behind in school, who can't work remotely or get the resources they need or connect with others, so grow more isolated. In this COVID time, we see the beauty of God's earth more clearly, literally. Skies are cleaner, water is clearer, and we're grateful for the chance to see spring bloom when we've missed that beauty so often in our busyness. We see as creation rebounds just how much of a burden we had put on it. And apart from the threat of COVID and all those broken places in our world coming to light because of it, this week, we learned that yet another member of our human family, Ahmaud Arbery, was killed. Not this week. He was killed over two months ago, and we almost didn't even hear about it. As we learn more, we see again clearly that racism is alive in our community. So the question for us as Christians is whether we will let it go unchecked and unchanged. After we've seen all this brokenness, will we stay quiet and just hope for the best? Or worse, will we pretend we don't see anything that needs to change and clamor after some picture of how we think things used to be? Or will we answer the call of Jesus Christ to bring his light into this darkness? It's a weighty call this call to be the second light, to reshape the world into a place where justice prevails and all are welcomed, whole, and loved. And like the disciples, we need a second wind for that work ahead. So I, for one, am glad today to go into Luke's gospel and to sit with the 11 and to see Jesus Christ again. I'm longing for Jesus, my risen Lord, to open my eyes because I'm looking for the sign that yes, he has conquered death and the power of evil. I want to see him more clearly and to be reminded that he abides with us even as he calls us to get to work. We pick up the Easter story just where we left it last week. Jesus has already appeared on the Emmaus Road and broken bread, and the ones who met him there go back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples what has happened. I picture them actually running and breaking into the gathering because they can't keep this news in for another minute. The Lord is risen. And then suddenly, they see Jesus. Before they even react, Jesus is there. And he knows that the disciples need his peace. So his very first words to them are a blessing. Peace be with you. The disciples are having all the feels in this moment. When they see Jesus, they are startled and terrified, frightened and doubtful, disbelieving, wondering and joyful, all in five verses. I hear that range of emotions and reactions and I think the disciples in that moment are a lot like we are in these days. They're surprised by what's happening and terrified in the face of an unknown future. Their ministry has been disrupted and they don't have clear next steps. They feel loss and grief. They're frightened by an appearing Lord who was dead and doubtful about what is true and what to believe. They wonder what's gonna come and what it will mean for them. 
And then finally, they're joyful even in their uncertainty. Joyful because the Lord is risen. Joyful because their Savior and their friend has come back to bring them peace and to give them a second wind. In this moment, in this scene, we see again what kind of Savior we follow. He is concerned for them. He knows they have questions, and instead of chastising them for doubting, he physically offers himself to them as the answer. He eats a piece of fish, and just as he has done in so many meals before and does every time we share in communion, he welcomes them into the good news of his resurrection. He humbly says to them, touch me and see. He shows them his hands and feet, wounds and all, so that they can believe. His hands and feet carry so much here. They prove to the disciples that Jesus is who he says he is. They are bare and wounded. They make him vulnerable, and they are reminders of the horror of his death and the violence that humans still inflict on each other today. They hold his love as he reaches out to his friends. In Jesus' hands and feet, we see all of his ministry and purpose. They bear all the things he has done, all the places he has been, and all the things he is still calling us to do. In her book, Home by Another Way, Barbara Brown Taylor, great preacher, has a sermon on part of this same text called Hands and Feet. She writes about how personal hands and feet are, how they mark us with our scars and tell our stories, even though we don't usually go around showing them to each other. She writes about what we see clearly as Jesus shows the disciples his. Look at my hands and feet, Jesus said. And when they did, they saw everything he had ever been to them. They saw the hands that had broken bread and blessed broiled fish, holding it out to them over and over again. They saw the hands that had pressed pads of mud against a blind man's eyes and taken a dead girl by the hand so that she rose and walked. They saw the hands that danced through the air when he taught the same hands that reached out to touch a leper without pausing or holding back, and his feet, the ones that had carried him hundreds of miles, taking his good news to all who were starving for it into the homes of criminals and corrupt bureaucrats whom he treated like long-lost kin. He wanted them to know he had gone through the danger and not around it, so he told them to look, not at his face, not into his eyes, but at his hands and feet, which told the truth about what had happened to him, which were the only proof he had that he was who he said he was. He left us something to recognize him by, his hands and feet, just like ours, or almost like ours. You know what his said about him? What do ours say about us? Where have they been? Whom have they touched? How have they served? What have they proclaimed? Friends, in this time of disruption, we see with new clarity many dark places in this world. But on this Easter journey, we meet Jesus again. We know him by his hands and feet. We remember that the Lord we follow leads with humility and welcomes all. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can answer the same call Jesus brought to those disciples so long ago to bring light to those dark places, to replace vanity with humility, disparity with justice, violence with peace, and hatred with love. Amen.
Will you join me as we confess our faith with one voice, using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now turn to God in prayer. Lord God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, by sending your only begotten Son into the world and pouring forth upon us the spirit of love, you have revealed to us your will for the world, that death is not an end, but a beginning. Sustain our faith and fill us with your love and peace that, joined together in the communion of your church, we may bless your holy and glorious name and with your light shine upon the world. We are living through uncertain and anxious times. Help us, O Lord, to place our faith and trust in you, that we will set aside our fears and our angst and turn toward your ever-loving embrace. May we be a people who set about this world with strength and confidence that you are our sovereign Lord, that we are striving to make this world more just and equitable, modeled on your kingdom of grace and infinite love rather than the powers and principalities that prevail in our sinful world. We cannot think about love and not be reminded that today, even if it's not on a liturgical calendar, is also Mother's Day. And so, God, we do thank you for our mothers and for those who were like mothers to us, who nurtured and supported us and enabled us to grow and mature in faithfulness. We thank you for those who've been like mothers to children not their own, offering unconditional love and guidance to the children in their midst. We thank you for the gift of creativity that you planted within us, women and men alike, that enable us by your spirit to give birth to a new creation. And so we pray for those who are mothers, for the joy and challenge of their vocation. May you grant them courage and grace to parent to the best of their ability, knowing that even our best efforts fall short, but are redeemed by your grace and forgiveness. And we also join our hearts with those for whom today is a day of grief and mourning those who have lost their mothers or who are estranged from them, those who are struggling re with reproductive loss, for whom motherhood is a hope yet denied. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who bear the cross of Christ this day, for those who give of themselves without regard to the cost. We pray for parents of those who are on the front lines of this pandemic. Uh, may they be medical workers or people harvesting or delivering our food. We didn't even know what everyday heroes were in our midst before this pandemic. And when it is over, may we never forget. May we better honor all people in our society. Write your words upon our hearts, merciful God. Plant your transforming love in our spirits. Give us courage. The Lord, accept all our prayers this day. We ask all of it in the name of Christ Jesus. He who died that we might live, and who lives that we may never die, and who taught his disciples to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. One good thing we have seen in this disrupting time is the generosity of this community. Thank you all for your many gifts, financial and gifts of time and talent. Thank you for coming to organize the food pantry, to sort mail. Thank you for making lunches and walking them here in wagons in the trunks of cars. Thank you for sharing your time with each other to make a call to reach out. Thank you to our musicians and those who are talented with cameras and sound for helping us to make all of this possible, though we are far apart. 
as we hear a beautiful offertory anthem this morning. I invite you to go to the website if you're inclined to make a financial gift today, www.firstpresatl.org slash give. Thank you.
Let us pray. God of all goodness, we give you thanks for every blessing you have bestowed upon us. We are grateful for the gift of food and the opportunity we have to feed others in your name. We are grateful for the blessing of shelter and the opportunity we have to care for the homeless. We give thanks for the love of friends and family and your call to love even our enemies. You have given us much, and we pray for the opportunity to share as disciples of your love. Help us to receive your blessings and your challenges with gratitude. May we find that through your grace, blessings become challenges and challenges become blessings. Amen. Today we have seen Jesus again. He has shown us his hands and his feet and welcomed us. So in the days ahead, all the days ahead, may we hold on to the good we see and where we see darkness, may we go there with light. And as we go, may we know that our Lord abides with us and gives us peace. Amen.
thank you for watching today's broadcast. For more video content, I'd encourage you to visit our website, firstpressatl.org. We'd love to see you here sometime at the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street to join us for worship. Thanks again for watching.